my first name is Renata, R-E-N-A-T-E, Renata, and the last name Reutlinger. Here it would be called Reutlinger in, the, in English. That's R-E-U-T-L-I-N-G-E-R. I was born in Stuttgart, which is a, a big city in the southern end of um, Germany. But I lived further south in a much smaller town called Kirchheim. They had a very small Jewish population, but Dad had a business there. So that's why we lived uh, in the city, in that small old town. It was right by uh, the Alps and um, the Black Forest. As soon as he came to power, as I said, uh, one of the first visible things was the Nuremberg Laws in 1935. That began to separate us. So he took it slowly, went to see how the Germans would react. He didn't just shove it the whole problem out in the sea, and, and they seemed okay with it. So, um, so it started in 19, and of course the biggie was 1938, November 9th and 10th, which is Kristallnacht. I mean, that was, that was really uh, when we were persecuted men taken to jail and so forth and so on and concentration camps. So that was 1938. Because Jewish men were at high risk of being taken away, Ronnie's father managed to find a single ticket to Cuba. Ronnie's mother insisted he travel to Cuba and she and Ronnie would get the next boat. The dad left, had made, mom had purchased two tickets to go to Cuba to be with him. And the particular ship she was going to go on was going to leave June the 1st, 1939. And one day she, get a phone, she gets a phone call from the travel agent. <coughs> and he said to her that there's so many German Jews going to Cuba. They set up this... <laughs> huge luxurious line of this big ship and uh, it was going to have eight decks and it's going to hold a thousand people and it has all the accommodations uh, you could possibly want and the most important thing is it was leaving may 13th now that's almost a month earlier and the question he had for mom was do you want to change your reservation you know, from the June 1st to this one. And my mom immediately said, yes. So that we boarded the ship, the St. Louis, <coughs> May 13th, which happened to be a Saturday, 1939. And the voyage itself was just, to me as a kid, totally uneventful. I mean, it, it was fun to go around in different decks and just so forth. But... Um, I, re I do remember when we arrived in Cuba, Mom, I didn't know where we were going. I didn't know where Cuba was or anything, but Mom had told me we'd be with my father. Now, that was for an important point, and I wanted to be with my father, so um, I was very excited when we arrived. I know the ship got there very early, like I think it was 5 in the morning, really early, and I remember we had um, a very early breakfast. And then the loudspeaker told us to go up on deck. And as I looked overboard, I saw my father. Now, he was standing up in this tiny little rowboat. <laughs> Remember, he's in Cuba. Uh, years later, I asked him, how'd you get there so fast? Because we had just arrived. He had been so anxious to be with us, you know, wife and child, that he stood vigil on the shores in Havana throughout the entire night, he told me. And the moment that the ship actually docked, he paid a Cuban to row him <laughs> as close to us as he was legally permitted. He wasn't allowed to go right to the ship. There was like a little uh, leeway there. So uh, that was very exciting for me to see my father. Even though we had purchased what were called legal landing certificates, and they were quite expensive. And they were signed by Cuba's Minister of Immigration. And their purpose was to let us go legally into Cuba. Cuba didn't let, wouldn't let us in. 
After all that, wow. the Cuban government just would not let, let us in. And every day I would say to my mother, uh, so when are we getting off the ship? Because the whole purpose was to go to Cuba. And um, she always answered me with tomorrow. He just wouldn't go back. He, um, he really, he was another one that saved our lives. Because he had already been told, you're going to lose your job. You lost your job. And uh, he, he was threatened. There was nothing else he could do except leave. He was forced to leave Cuba, and he had sent a final cablegram to the president. He wasn't getting any help, so he had to leave Cuba. Um, and that day I'll always remember because um, I was just playing on deck, and I felt the ship was lurching, and I, I realized we're moving. We're going somewhere. So I sort of panic. I didn't know where we were going. I had no idea where we were going. So I go to my mother's cabin, and she's just lying on her cot, and she's just sobbing uncontrollably. So I go up on deck, and I see adults, men and women, and they're just tears are streaming. Well, I mean, I knew we were going somewhere. I knew this. I knew my dad's in Cuba. He's not with us. I didn't know where we were going. But what would have been even more scary for me is that the adults had no idea where we were going. And the captain didn't know where he was taking us. But we passed the Miami coastline so close that every passenger could see the shimmering lights of Miami Beach. That's how close we were. Wow. And one final cablegram, and this is documented, was sent by Gustav Schroeder, that's the captain, to the president, Roosevelt, pleading with him to allow the 200 kids that were aboard the St. Louis sanctuary. And he never responded. He had this big decision what to do with us. I mean, we're a lot of people. People have to be fed, etc., etc. He's getting threatening letters. So it gave a Mr. Trooper that <coughs> he was the head of an organization called the Joint Distribution Committee. He was a European. He lived in France. And he had the chance to try to get some other countries to help us. And he did. He got England, Holland, Belgium, and France. Four countries. We were to be divided. So you might say roughly a thousand, you know, four and two. And um, so anyway, so so uh, we were going to be uh, taken in by those countries. And of course, the whole tragedy of the ship, which is why it's sort of a pivot point in history, was that those that went to Holland, Belgium, France, not all. But many of the passengers were recaptured when the Germans came in. Wow. Now, of course, everyone that went to England were safe. Now, I got to tell you that at the time of the ship, you didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in retrospect, history is it's easy to talk about. But uh, the reality is you didn't know. I think it was 245 that went to England. Now, Mom and I went to Holland. We didn't go to, to England. And um, I asked <coughs> my mother once, is that your choice? Did they say you got to go to Holland? And what she told me was that the captain sent around a piece of paper to the adults. And you check off England, Holland, Belgium, France. But, and mom said she chose Holland. I said to her, well, how come you chose Holland, not England? Again, she didn't know it. She said, because Holland's surrounded by the sea and surrounded by water, still close to Germany. Her whole family was still in Germany. So she felt she could be a phone. She could be in, in touch, you know, with her parents, her sisters, because mom was the first one to leave. So that's why she chose Holland. Now, so I know mostly about Holland because that's where I, I was. Now, the entire ship 
went to Antwerp, Antwerp, Belgium. And in Antwerp, for those that went to England, uh, boarded another, um, another ship and so forth. Now, I remember boarding a smaller ship because we were 189. Now, this I know about Holland. It only took those with low quota numbers. And the reason was Holland was swollen with refugees. And the government wanted to help us, but figured help them and then out go to America so they could get rid of us again. So I remember uh, boarding this smaller ship and as we went around the Dutch coast, that very, very hilly, uh, it looked to me like hundreds of Dutch people. And they were all like cheering on, you know, like uh, clapping when we passed by and, and just, uh, it just made me feel a little bit better. Uh, I was uh, getting used to being rejected by, <laughs> by different countries, yeah. But when we got to uh, Rotterdam, which is where we went, we were not given our freedom. We were put in a detention camp. Now, the detention camp they put us in was called Rotterdam West. And their mom and I were pretty much separated. She was put, they called it an adult compound. And I was put in what they called a children's compound. So I saw my mother, but not often. You know, it's not like we, we shared a bedroom or anything. She was off in her adult compound. I was stuck with a group of kids. <clears throat> in other words, I was on my own, pretty much on my own. So what I remember most about the camp is, A, I was always hungry. Now, I don't want to tell you that we didn't get fed. That would not be true. Just wasn't enough food. And I'm just a little girl. And B, it was a filthy camp because most of the, I envision, talk about camp, you think of grass. For whatever reason, there was no grass in this camp. It was just dirt and rocks, lots of rocks. It was right off the Atlantic Ocean. It was a detention camp, I want to tell you. It's not a concentration camp. But I feel, I feel I, I should mention, it still has a high barbed wire fence. And it has a, a guard at the gate. So you can only leave the camp if you get permission. You know, something's going on, you get permission. You can't walk in and out as, as it suits you. So mom gets the paper, she tells me. And she gets permission to leave the camp. She now has to go to the American Council for the proper papers to leave. And he says to her, there's no more ships leaving Holland. So he thought that the best thing she could do was <clears throat> to stay in the camp until the war's over. Every story you hear is going to be different. But I would say that everybody has a little bit of luck with whatever happened to them to get out. Because those who didn't stay behind, person in charge of the camp, and by the way, the camp was not just for the 189. There were a bunch of refugees from all over that were stuck in the same camp as us. And uh, the person in charge, he was called a commander. And his job, he was like in charge of the camps. And he, luckily for us, was a captain in the Dutch Navy, just coincidentally. And she wanted to give him something before she approached him. Because though I didn't recognize it, but of course it's a matter of life and death. Either he's going to help us get out or we're stuck in there. Who knows what happens to us after that. So she found out he was a stamp collector. Now, um, before we left Germany, each of us had one big suitcase. And mom said to me, you can put into your suitcase one item of your cho choosing, like uh, maybe a book or a game or, you know. And I thought this over very carefully. And I decided on the stamp collection. And that was because Michael Billy, who's my favorite uncle, lived a block away, used to come almost every day in Germany to visit me. And he uh, realized, A, I was very lonely and no friends, none, zero. And B, I wasn't doing anything. Remember, I'd been thrown out of first grade, so I wasn't exactly a wonderful reader. 
So he decided if he starts a stamp collection, teach me a little geography, history, bought a stamp book, put the stamps into the stamp book. So I decided to take that because I wasn't sure if I'd ever see him again. And um, now my mother comes to the children's compound and she wants my stamp collection. And I told her, no, I'm not going to give it to you because this was the one thing that was my choice. And she's trying to explain this very nice man is going to help us get out of here so we could go to your father. And I'm thinking, if he's such a very nice man, he'll help us without my stamp collection. <laughs> the answer was no. So mom left. But one day when I'm playing outside and I go back, it was sort of like a dormitory, you know, one cot after another. Mm -hmm. That was, And I had found an orange clip in the camp somewhere, which I had dragged. It was like, a, like my little bookcase <laughs> <laughs> where I put my few little belongings. And I saw right away my stamp collection was missing. And I knew mom had taken it, which she had. When I was not in, in there, she had gone into my dorm and taken my stamp clip and given it to him. And he did help us. Now, what he told her was that the American Council was correct. There were no more ships leaving Holland. But he said to Mom, why don't you take a ship from Antwerp, you know, from Belgium, which was a train right away? And she said, of course. So he got us the transportation to go to Antwerp, Belgium. And when we reached, uh, which of course the American Council knew as well, I mean, mm -hmm. and when we reached Antwerp, Bel uh, when we reached uh, uh, Antwerp, um, we had a wonderful little surprise. My aunt, mom's younger sister, and my uncle were taking that same ship. They have, have, were coming from Luxembourg okay. to Antwerp because apparently that was the only place left for ships to go to the USA. And uh, together we, we took the ship. It was an extra treat for me because my aunt and uncle were first class. Mom and I were third class. So I remember every morning walking up steep steps. And I remember I was a little girl. That's probably why they seemed steep. All the way up to first class. And I had a lunch and breakfast with my aunt and uncle. Mom was, of course, stuck downstairs. And Mom kept saying to me, we're going to America now. You're going to be with your father. And I didn't believe a word that she <laughs> said. But I was smart enough not to verbalize my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I just nodded. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until we got off the ship. We, we went to New York Harbor. We got off the ship. My dad picked me up and he's twirling me around. Mm -hmm. Then I was happy because I knew I was finally with my father. It's very difficult to come into a new country where you do not know one word of English and you have to and this was before we never got anything from the government. Of course. Whether we're federal, state, local, or the Jewish community, whatever dad was able to earn, that's what we lived on. Ronnie now speaks to students and adults about her experiences and says if we forget the lessons of the past, we are surely to allow history to repeat itself. If not with the Jews, with the Irish, the Italians, the Africans, the Americans, let us not forget. 